Welcome to One Heart for Israel's presentation of our Dig series, taking you through some of the most fascinating places in the land of Israel. We're excited to take you with us today as we explore one of the most amazing sites that every pilgrim visits when they go to Israel. Yet, yet most will tell you that once they've been there, they won't go back to this site again because it's too hot, too dry, too much to climb. But because this is the land where God placed his name and places people and, and the promise after he, he himself walked through this land, he will return and rule the nations from here. This is a very special place. And we're honored to share it with you, not just because of the history or, or the present or even the future of this land, but because every part of the land the stories and the people give meaning to our lives today and from the pages of the Bible. By the moving of the Holy Spirit, our lives are changed when we discover the reason God has created us and how deeply he desires to be in a committed saving relationship with him. So let us begin by praying and asking him to be our guide on our journey today as we travel through the wilderness to Masada. Lord Jesus, today we just want so much to understand that as we journey through these places in Israel, that you walk with us as our guide. You were there before us. You created this to teach us about you, about how faithful you are to us and how you continue to call us to stand for you. And even in the difficult times, the times of our wilderness, we stand for you, Lord. And, and, the, and the strength that you give us in those times and the rewards that you give us of the joy and the peace, the success of coming through difficult times, Lord, just because of you. So God, be our guide today and, and walk us through this place and through this your text here as we understand what took place here, what it meant to them then, what it means to us today. We invite you now to walk with us and, and guide us in your name, Jesus. Amen. So today we'll depart from Jerusalem. We'll travel down the road that descends about 4,000 feet and just about 20 miles, and we'll reach the ancient city of Jericho. And then from there, we'll head south for about 45-minute drive through the Negev Desert along the shores of the Dead Sea to the rocky prominence in the heart of the desert called Masada. So I'm going to show you a map right here. On this map, okay, it, it, it takes you to, uh, uh, kind of gives you an overview of where we're at. Uh, Jerusalem is there in the yellow, then it takes you down to Jericho and it comes you down past the Dead Sea. I kind of want to give you just a heads up about the Dead Sea here. Okay, The Dead Sea is actually the lowest physical location on earth. It stands a, a, little, bit, a little bit more than 800 feet below sea level. It's a actually a beautiful place. And, and you can see there the, the, the uh, salt formations of the rock because the Dead Sea is actually about 30, a little bit more than 30% salt. Uh, it's really fun to go there where you can you lay in the, in the sea and you can float. It's, it's a very interesting uh, experience because you can float in the sea. You don't dive. Uh, you can't get underwater because you're so buoyant because of the salt. And at this point in time, the Dead Sea is actually uh, diminishing because that fresh water that runs the Jordan River that is the only source of fresh water, of water into the Dead Sea, is being used by agriculture and, 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 and human consumption in Israel. And so the Jordan River has not been pouring that much water into the Dead Sea in many, many years. And the Dead Sea is beginning to diminish and dry up. Uh, it's really interesting also there's, there's large uh, pockets of potholes uh, that, that are around the Dead Sea now that are forming. And the sinkholes uh, that are causing some issues of some buildings that have been built there many years. But it's along the Dead Sea and around the Dead Sea is, is so much biblical history. It is where the Jordan River ends and runs into the Dead Sea. It's where Jericho lies. It's the beginning of the desert going south in Israel called the Negev Desert. Along that Negev is a road there that on the eastern side is called the King's Highway that runs from Egypt up into Asia. On the west side of the Dead Sea is a very interesting place that's been there for, for, for from the time of King David, even before, before King David, called En Gedi which is a beautiful little place that you walk up into the hills and there's, there's two waterfalls and a stream that water that runs down from, from up north above Hebron runs down into the Dead Sea from there. And it's a beautiful place. And it's a place where David hid when he was running from King Saul. 
and have some, some great adventures. We'll do that in another briefing and tell you the stories of and Getty will take you there. Further south, um, about 15 miles south of En Gedi, is this mountain, this rock formation called Masada. Now, it's the eastern edge of the Judean desert, and it has a sheer drop of more than 1,300 feet to the western shore of the Dead Sea. It's a place of majestic beauty. It's also the site of one of the most dramatic episodes in all of Jewish history. And I'm going to take you there today, but I want to take and show you a lot of things about this location, this place it is. It's actually also not that, not that far north of the southern end of the Dead Sea. The southern end of the Dead Sea is where most scholars, almost all scholars, believe that Sodom and Gomorrah were. And so this area that we're traveling along the western side of the Dead Sea is the area where Abraham brought Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah, where the stories of that took place. It's a very, very, very desolate desert, rocky area. It's beautiful, but it's something you want to drive through uh, and, and, and visit and see and keep going to your hotel. According to the first century historian Josephus Flavius, the first to fortify his natural defenses position was Jonathan the high priest. Now this is in this is at Masada. Uh, before Herod, Herod built this this uh, place on top of Masada. So I kind of want to give you a little bit of background about Masada the top. So this Jonathan the high priest was there and is controversial among scholars as to which Jonathan uh, was actually there. He had in mind. But, the, but the, the man who turned Masada into the formidable fort it became was King Herod the Great. Now we have the writings from a man by the name of Josephus Flavius. And he was a captain of the Jewish army um, up north. And he was supposed to secure the northern part of the, Jez the Jordan River Valley from any army that would march uh, south. And when the Romans came in there, he just he surrendered. And he went and told them, I'm really more of a historian or writer than I am a captain. And so he was taken by the, by the Romans, and he was actually incarcerated by them. And he made an agreement with them that he would write about their annals, and write their story, if they would allow him to write as a, a writer for them. So Josephus Flavius is actually a Jewish man who wrote the stories of, and this is how we have all the, the siege of Jerusalem and the siege of Masada, and much of the stories in uh, the, some of the, his writings, one of them called The Wars. Um, and so he's a major writer. Uh, most scholars would agree that most all of the things that he wrote are probably true. Um, and so he gives us a lot of detail, a lot of uh, things going about the, from the first century. Okay, so so the, the Masada was actually built and developed by King Herod. But it was developed before this by someone by the name of Jonathan. We're not exactly sure who it was, but some years before. Now, in the years, uh, in the years be between 36 and 30 B.C., Herod built up the fortress and the palaces on Masada. But let me take you just back just for a second. I want to give you a little bit of a background of Herod. And we're talking about Herod the Great. Herod the Great was born in 73 BC. He was born in a very, very difficult time for the Jews because uh, it was after the Hasmonean society um, uh, came to power and, and was destroyed. Rome comes to power um, in, in the, around 64 BC and starts marching into the area of, of Syria, coming south to, to uh, Israel. And so Rome is beginning to conquer the land when Herod grows up. Now, Herod is an Edomian. He's from the area of Edom. And uh, his mother was actually a Nabataean, which is from the area we know now as Jordan. And there's a very famous place. That a lot of people talk about Petra. There's actually stories of Herod the Great as a young boy going to Petra, actually even doing battle with the Nabataeans after a time where he was actually friends with the Nabataeans. So there's a lot of history about Herod the Great. What I want you to understand is this. Herod the Great was an incredible builder, one of the most accomplished builders in all of history to this time. But he was a mess. He was a wreck. He was a madman. Two of his sons, he's sent to Rome to be educated. And when he went to Rome and got them and brought them back to Israel, he was afraid they were going to take his throne, so he killed them. Herod took out family members because of the threat that they, he felt that they were to his throne. There are many, many stories about Herod the Great that are just unbelievable, tragic stories. But the one thing that we do know about him is he was an unbelievable builder and visionary of places. And so after Herod the Great had come to power, 
in about the, the, the 30s to the 20s BC is when he really started his major building construction projects. And some of the things that he would build up was Caesarea Maritima, a major port city uh, along the Israeli coastline, uh, just north of what is now Tel Aviv, it was north of Jaffa at the time, because Israel didn't have a great port city. So Herod built this incredible port city for a for deep, deep water port for large ships to come in. And the ruins today are just are amazing to go see. The other building project certainly he did was a temple in Jerusalem, which was one of his greatest building projects. Masada was third in this whole list of the great projects. So Josephus writes that Herod prepared this fortress as a refuge against two types of danger. Now, now follow me on this. One for the fear of the multitude of the Jews who would desire to kill him and restore their former leadership. Herod was always at odds with the Hasmonean dynasty and the people that still wanted to come back to that Hasmonean leadership, which was more of a spiritual leadership in the temple. In fact, at one point in time, Herod appointed a, a, a man of the high priest to be a high priest who was actually from Babylonia. So, so the problems that Herod had uh, of, of appeasing the, the people, the Jews from the Hasmonean um, background uh, and, and that from the Roman background was a, a fine line that he continued to try to walk and he angered the Jews tremendously, tremendously in Israel. So he was afraid that a lot of people would try to kill him and restore the former leadership. The other reason he would build things was greater and more terrible, which came from uh, Cleopatra. Now, this is not the original Cleopatra. This is actually Cleopatra the Seventh, Queen of Egypt at the time. And she didn't hide her intentions, but spoke often to Anthony, her boyfriend, and desired him, Anthony, to destroy everything about Herod and give her the kingdom of Judah. Now, Anthony never did this. He never did comply with her commands, but he didn't minimize, it didn't minimize Herod's fear of her. He was always afraid that, that Anthony, who he was friends with in Rome, okay, would turn against him and Cleopatra. At, even at one point in time, that uh, after Herod's death, Cleopatra did get control of, uh, of Jericho and some other small cities at, for a time, for a time. But Herod conducted three major building projects in this location. Now, in this location, we're talking back to Masada. This is a mountain. It stands about 1,300 feet high above the desert floor. It's only about 18 acres in size at the top. It's very, very difficult to get to the top of this mountain. At the, uh, until they put a cable car up there, the only way was called a snake path. I'll show that to you in a moment. So he conducted three major building projects in this location. The first was in the center of the mountaintop. Um, but it was, it was a palace. It had some housing for soldiers, which protect and maintain the mountain as a defense. And there were some, a few storage buildings. The second... And third of the building projects, there's a picture of the top of this now, uh, he constructed elaborate three-tier palace. Now that's on the lower part of your, of your screen right now. And just in back of that are enormous um, storage compartments. Um, and, but the, the, this, was, this was an amazing, amazing construction project that he did. And he built defense towers. He built massive storehouses, large cisterns, uh, one cistern alone. Uh, was with about a half a million cubic yard a cubic feet of, of water and uh, and they were filled ingeniously by occasional rainwater he also built barracks arsenals and palaces now now let me as that picture's up there let me explain this what's going on with that picture okay um, around this mountain Herod built troughs around it that would have a fall to it when you come down and the purpose of it was the dew of the morning would drop down into these troughs and run down around the mountain, run into cisterns. Okay, and each time that there was, there, there was very, very seldom do you get rain in this desert, but when you do, it collected all the rain that ran into cisterns. So, this this mountain was designed to have enough water to last uh, a thousand people, two thousand people indefinitely with water, indefinitely. Also had places where you can with the, with indefinite amount of water, you could also plant crops and grow crops up there. Now today you can reach the summit in one of two day, one of two ways, and uh, the first one is the snake path. This is a picture of the snake path. It's actually a very rare picture. 
Because if you look closely at the pictures, you see a lot of people on the snake path walking up that snake path at this point in time. Honestly, I've been there over 50 times, and I've never seen that many people on the snake path at one time, ever. So this may have been a whole group that decided they were going to go. Um, let me explain something to you. You're traveling 1,300 feet up. It is in very, very, very hot desert. Most of the people, this is probably taken, probably taken very early in the morning because if you're going to do the snake path, you want to do it early in the morning. After about 10, 11 o'clock, oftentimes they even close it because it's just too hot. In, uh, in, in uh, um, June, July, August, September, typically it's closed during the day because it's just too hot. At a good pace, at a good pace, if you are in great shape, you can make the top of the hill in about 45 to 55 minutes if you're in great shape. I've taken some groups there, some people that weren't in good shape, they want to do it. I tried to convince them not to. And I had some people that would stop about halfway up after about an hour and a half. And they actually, they never made it to the top. It is a very difficult climb. Some place very narrow. And, and it, has, it has been the disastrous place of some people actually to fall off the mountain and lose their life. Uh, because there's not a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, rails there. And so it's, it can be a dangerous uh, with some loose rocks on it. So the other way is the cable car. This is the way that someone like me gets to the top of Masada. This is the cable car, and it's a very, very exciting, gorgeous, gorgeous ride up. It's smooth. You, even though it's hot there, um, it's nothing like, uh, uh, it's nothing like uh, taking the snake path. And uh, the views are spectacular for the spectator who wants to take the, the cable car up. This is a picture taken just from the side of coming down from the top along into along the side of the three um, palaces of Herod, the northern palaces, and so just a picture of the Dead Sea in the top there and the and the uh, the land there. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful view from there. So this is an artist rendering of the palaces built by King Herod for him and his family. Now notice these three buildings. I want to describe something to you that's very interesting about this. If you look carefully at the top building, that is on the top of the mountain. The second one is on, as you come down, the second one was, is, is a, most scholars say it's probably a welcoming room for, the, for guests that he would have there. At a 360 view, or almost a 360 view of the beautiful view around them. And then the lower palace was very, very interesting. The, the width of that land there at the bottom, narrowest place, was just a matter of maybe 10 or 15, not even that, maybe 10 yards wide. It was very narrow. But Herod had his engineers build a palace there, and they went down about 12 to 18 meters on both sides, and they built up sides of the mountain to support the weight of a palace on this. And the weight of the palace had columns that would run 18 to 20 feet high around the perimeter. It was a spectacular engineering move by adding on the side structurally of a mountain to support a palace on top of it. Now remember, remember, the only way to get to this was to go up the snake path 1,300 feet and then come along the top and then come walk down to this place. So the construction of this would have been an incredible feat to do by hands, without machinery. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, um, uh, uh, Mazar was one of the first uh, uh, wonderful arche uh, archaeologists to, to do digs on the top of Masada. And he tells the stories of how difficult it was for them to get equipment to the top of Masada just to do the archaeological work there. And how difficult that snake path was. And how difficult it was that they could only carry a certain amount of weight up that snake path because it was just too, too dangerous to carry a lot of weight. So, so this is the palaces that Herod the Great built here. And it was, it was an engineering genius to build these things. Now, uh, um, now, so this is a picture of me standing actually in the lower palace. And this is today, or this is just recently, maybe a few pizzas ago, but not, not too long ago. And uh, uh, you can see that the frescoes that are painted there is still the painting, is still the color of the painting on the walls from the time of Herod the Great. Okay, so this is 2,000 years old. Now they have actually restored some of the columns, and the columns were actually covered um, there with plaster, so it was looked like they were so solid columns, but they weren't, they were pieces, 
that were cut and brought down there in pieces. Um, but it was a very majestic place. And throughout this, throughout this place on the top of Masada, it's a very interesting place because you still have the beautiful colors from the frescoes that were painted 2,000 years ago because the desert is just so dry there. It sustains everything. Let me take you to another place on the mountain here. This is one of the major bathhouses at Masada. It's actually a steam room for they would put columns on the bottom of the floor. On the top of these columns, they would put a marble floor. And on the sides, in the, in the very back corner on the left of that picture, are actually round pieces of, of uh, pottery that go up the walls where they would, the, the slaves and the people would pour extremely hot boiling water underneath of this and it would steam up to the floor and along the walls and become a steam room. It was genius. It was brilliant. There's another one of these, a beautiful place that is still restored like that in a place called uh, Bet Shion, which is up north. Um, uh, but Herod the Great built this and it was an amazing, amazing bathhouse and steam room. Now, I'm thinking, like you, if the temperature goes to 130 degrees in the summer there, why do I want a steam room? My answer is easy. I have no idea. But they did. So these, and, and all, the second thing they built there was they built many, many ritual baths. And so they would cut down into the, into the stone and they would plaster it and they'd fill it full of water and these were ritual baths. And I'm not sure how many ritual baths, they don't know how many ritual baths were on the mountain, but there were many, many up there. Okay. And the reason was because uh, uh, there was a synagogue that they put up there. And so there was a reason for them to go through the ritual cleansing of the ritual baths before they would go to synagogue. This sl next slide is an amazing slide. This is the largest uh, cistern on the mountain. And the scholars would say that this cistern would hold about a half a million gallons of water. So you can see that uh, they would take carbon stone and they would plaster it. Um, so that the, the, the water would sustain, be sustained in there and uh, uh, there would be an indefinite amount of, of water that's necessary. This is some of the work they did on this mountain. Next place is, is the remains of an ancient synagogue there. Uh, the synagogue is against, built against the walls and many, many of the, of the small buildings were built into the walls. The walls were about six foot thick, and, and what the last building project that Herod the Great did there was he built the casement walls all the way around the perimeter of the top of the 18-acre Masada. And so uh, there's a, a, as you see back in the area, there's a small doorway back there, and, and uh, there is a rabbi who copies Torah on that mountain whenever that is open. And if you're very kind to him, the rabbi will have the opportunity to stop for a moment and write you a note in Hebrew. And, uh, and hand it to you. He's very, very kind there, a wonderful man. But he copies Torah there. Now, there's a very interesting reason that he is on that mountain constantly copying Torah. But I'll get to that in a few moments. I want to describe the water system. This is, this is a picture of the model that they have on the mountain that shows you uh, how they would cut out the side of the mountain. It would come around the mountain. The water would, would roll into the cisterns. And they were in such a way that the holes were very, very small uh, of, of, the, of those ditches coming into the cisterns. So you could not climb into the cistern, cistern from the outside of the mountain. You had, they dug a hole from the top of the mountain all the way down to the cistern to access the water. Very, very genius. Okay? Uh, the next place I want to take you to is the storehouses on Masada. Now these are uh, they're, they're about 120 feet long. They're about 30 feet wide, each single one of them. They're huge, and they had massive, massive storehouses. Some people believe that they that some of them held grain, a lot of food stuff, and so they could support all that. And they also would support weapons and, uh, and ammunition. They, there's a lot of rocks that they would cut um, to use uh, to throw down as far as catapult rocks and all kinds of slingshots and, and all kinds of rocks because you had virtually in this mountain, you had an endless supply of rocks. The last picture of the Masada I want to show you about this is um, for several years it was it was incredible that they actually set up an enormous stage and did operas on the floor of the desert right in front of the mountain Masada. And so they lit the mountain as backdrops for the these great operas that they would do. And so people would drive down there and uh, and attend these incredible, gorgeous operas with the scenes and the sets. Um, that would run maybe 100, 200 feet high, and the, the whole backdrop was the lights 
and the projection against the mountain of Asada. Just an amazing, amazing place. So now I want to take you to the story of Masada. In the first century, Palestine was under the occupation of the Romans, who had overthrown the Jewish Maccabean kingdom in the middle of the previous century. Periodic rebellion by the inhabitants who sought to regain their freedom and sovereignty had been quickly crushed by the Romans. But in the year 66 AD, the Jewish revolt flared up to a full-scale countrywide war, which raged for bitterness, fierce bitterness, for 400 years. The Romans found themselves bringing legion after legion of reinforcements to suppress the challenge. Now, in 70 AD, the, Romans, the Roman general Titus conquered Jerusalem. He sacked the city. He destroyed the temple expelled the bulk of the Jewish survivors from the country. Now, about a thousand of these survivors traveled from there down to a place called Masada. And here is the story of Masada. It is the one alone outpost that held for three years after the fall of Jerusalem. It was these fortifications and buildings which served the last band of Jewish fighters in their struggle against the Romans, some 75 years after Herod's death. Now, I want to explain to you who, first of all, who was coming. The 10th Legion, the Roman 10th Legion, was stationed in the Judean Providence, and it was known as the 10th Legion of the Strait. And this part of the Roman army had a long history of success. This legion was actually led at one point in time by Caesar Augustus. It was also led by Julius Caesar. It'd be kind of like in, in the American army, the 101st is very, very famous for being you know, one of the first uh, groups to, to, to run into, into, into the battle as far as the army. That 101st is usually the first one to respond. Okay? Now, archaeologists have found artifacts stamped with the name and number of this legion, as well as its icons. It had icons of, of a bull or a boar, uh, an animal, the, the boar, or a ship, and the god Neptune. They've all been found throughout, the, throughout Judea, including Jerusalem itself, of the 10th legion. This was a legion which was in Jerusalem during the time of the Acts of the Apostles. The Roman commander stationed at the Antonio Fortress heard of the conspiracy to kill Paul and ordered Paul's evacuation from Jerusalem to Caesarea. The commander of the 10th Legion, known as the Tribune, was responsible for 12 centurions and up to 1,000 soldiers. Now, this, this legion was a legion that would march to Masada for the purpose of capturing or destroying these 1,960 people that had, had gone to Masada. And there was a small Roman garrison on Masada when they went up there and they just killed them and destroyed them so they could take possession of the top of Masada. The Roman soldiers were legendary throughout the world. We understand it's a Roman world. They were typically equipped with armor of metal and leather, a shield, spears, a dagger and a short sword, a battle sword. The soldiers were usually clean shaven with short hair. Now I want to explain to you, I'm telling, giving you information about the 10th Legion because, because they endured difficult, difficult training and faced harsh penalties for not serving properly. As a matter of fact, listen to me. If one of the soldiers would not do what he needed to do in the, lead, in the Roman legions, punishment could be as severe as killing 10% of the entire unit because that one man failed his responsibility. So it was an army that must work together. It was an army that had to lift each other up. It, it's very much trained the way we train our armies today. Very much. Um, in the Masada of Israel, the, 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 uh, the special... The Green Beret and the SEALs and the special teams of our of the American armies trained this way. How imperative it is to work together and stay together. This was the type of army that was the bottom of Masada with orders to kill every Jew on top of that mountain. Now the only written source we have about Masada 
is from Josephus Flavius' book, The Jewish War. He wrote it here, uh, and, 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 and the, he wrote it here, and the Herod the Great, about Herod the Great, built the fortress of Masada. He wrote about this. At the beginning of the great revolt of the Jews against the Romans in 66, these rebels came and took this. They were joined by zealots. Now, the zealots were the assassins and the other people that were very, very zealous about, about keeping the, the Jewish uh, hopes alive, who had also fled from Jerusalem. So these 960 people, made up of men, women, and children, held out on the top of this hill, on this mountain, against the mightiest army in the world. How long do you think they could hold out against the army? And by the way, um, the army of, of the 10th Legion, with other legions around there, scholars say they probably had about 5,000 soldiers at the bottom of this mountain. 5,000 soldiers. How long do you think they could hold out? 900 men, women, and children of the Jews at the top of this mountain. Three years. Three years these Jews held the Romans at bay. But the Romans were not about to let even a handful of rebels, which were these rebels, okay, live. Now, let me explain something very important about where I'm going with this. I want you to understand something. The entire Roman army was the greatest army of the world. It was the only great army in the world. The 10th Legion was the creme de la creme of the Roman armies, except for, except for the army of Rome. In the Battle of Fields, the 10th, the 10th Legion was the best. And so, the, 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 the Romans were determined after they destroyed Jerusalem that they wouldn't even let 900 men, women, and children that fled to a place an hour away from Jerusalem by, by, by car, okay, about 60 miles south of Jerusalem in the middle of nowhere. They wouldn't even allow, they didn't want to allow, allow just a thousand of them to live. They were determined to destroy the Jews, every one of them, at all costs. Did you catch what I just said to you? Welcome to Hamas, Hezbollah, and much of Islam in the world today. At all costs. Hamas would not even allow the thought of allowing a thousand Jews to survive. Their goal is to kill every single Jew on earth. Understand this. Talk about parallels in history. The Romans were not concerned about the top of the mountain. They didn't want the land. They wanted to kill the Jews. I want you to see the parallels of this in time. When Hitler and the Nazis went into Poland and started killing the Jews, they didn't want the land. When they gathered the Jews in Europe, they didn't want the land. Where I'm going with this is this. There is a belief system of the Jews that they believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the war that is fought among men against the Jews is a spiritual battle. Welcome to Christians who are grafted in to the Old Testament and to the people of God. The war we fight is a spiritual battle. Now the Roman governor, Flavius Silva, marched against Masada with the 10th Legion. Not only did they have 5,000 soldiers, but they had about maybe up to 10,000 slaves, Jewish slaves. Okay? And the Roman camps, I want to show you a picture of the Roman camps here. This is a picture of one, one of the eight Roman camps encamped around the mountain of Masada. They're, they're amazingly laid out, and there has not been a lot of archaeology done in these camps, 
but there has been some. And one of the things, uh, one of the things I want you to see is just in front of that camp, you can see made out is a small wall from where we already stand on top of the mountain, so it's not easily seen from there. The Romans built a six foot wide by about twenty foot high wall around the entire perimeter of the mountain, so not one Jew could escape. Every hundred yards, there was a tower, a watchtower, to make sure not one Jew escaped from this. So the Roman camps around there. Now, I'm going to go back to the, the, the slide of the Roman camp just for one second. Expl look at this. Look carefully at this. The closest source of fresh water to Masada, outside of the rainwater that was in the mountain itself, is about 14 miles away. The closest source of food, dates, everything else like that, is about 14 miles away. You had about eight to 10,000 people encamped around this mountain that you needed to supply food and water for. If you can imagine, if you can imagine, I ran the math out, that if you run the math out, just if they eat two meals a day, two meals a day, in three years, you need about 10 million servings of food. You can imagine how frustrated the Romans could be in constantly running for food and water in a desert area where the temperatures in summer are 130 degrees. You can imagine how angry the Jews, how angry the Romans would be at the Jews for having to do this. So there is no way to breach this for the, there's no way the Romans could come up the snake path and, and breach the walls because it was it was much too difficult and much too steep for them to come up the side of the mountain with an army. The strategic advantage of the high ground the defenders could easily target their attackers, but the Romans were persistent. So this is what they did. They constructed a rampart, a siege ramp. This is a picture of what it looks like today. A siege ramp. And to keep from the Romans being murdered, they brought the Jewish slaves down. The Jewish slaves built this siege ramp of millions of stones together against the western side of the mountain. So they could move a siege machine up this ramp and breach the walls. Uh, it's, it's an absolutely astonishing feat imagining it would take three years for them to build this. Now let me take you to the story of the end of Masada. A man by the name of Eliezer was in charge of the people on the mountain. Eliezer ben Yair. He spoke to his people on the night before the Romans would breach the wall. Now this was the night of Passover. Just happened to be. And as you know, Passover is extremely important to the Jewish people. At the time that Passover, they would separate themselves from sin and separate themselves from the sin which, careful, listen to me carefully, enslaves us. And this Sabbath is the time of the covenant between the individual and one's God, which we separate ourselves from our sin, the bind, bondage of our sin. Masada has become the code word for the sanctity of freedom over slavery for the Jews. Eliezer ben Yar, the leader of the rebellion, gave a particular speech in which he emphasized the sanctity of this freedom as a supreme value for the Jewish people. And his speech became a model of values that has resonated for generations since that time. Now, in order to understand the debate on the final evening of the mountain thousands of years ago, we need to understand the essence of the concept of liberty. In modern language, liberty is defined as the freedom to choose, the freedom to vote, the freedom to express one's opinion, and the freedom to be who you are. That's liberty. We here in America take liberty very, very seriously. We take it to heart. Abraham Lincoln made an amazing speech about liberty one point in time. But in referring to, to the laws of, of, of the Jews, such as the Ten Commandments in Exodus 32, the tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing, 
engraved upon the tablets. But the Midrash, the Hebrew teaching says that they do not explain the word as engraved, but the word as, a, as an opening for freedoms. Now listen carefully to the definition of this. The true free person is one who engages in the word of God. The Jews would say in the Torah. According to the Jewish tradition, a free person is one who can express a deep relationship with God. That's one who is free, who walks with God, is one who is free. The rabbis explain that freedom is an inner reality of man who is not bound by anything but his inner connection with God. So your freedom, your freedom, your freedom, Paul writes this. The scripture talks about this a lot. You are free when you are free in Jesus. You're free when you walk with God. Because he gives those in sin, the bondage of sin, freedom from their sins. I did a lot of work with, uh, with people that were suffering and dealing with addictions in California for several years. And I would attend a lot of meetings with, with people from the HA and NA and AA. And, and the one word that I heard all of the time of people that were in bondage in these addictions was when they finally overcame this bondage, the word they would always say is, I'm free. I'm free. You see, sin is bondage. The decisions that you make that are not decisions that honor God put us in bondage and steal our freedoms. Now, the Sabbath day by the Jews expresses this freedom in the weekly cycle, life cycle. And so does the Passover Seder. It does this very same thing in the yearly life cycle. Because this is what they say. When the Sabbath arrives, every Jew, no matter where he or she is or what condition they find themselves, on the Sabbath, you are a free person. Because everything is already prepared, and all that is needed is to enjoy a restful manner with family and a deep connection to God and his word. You see, most of our connections to the things that enslave us daily are prohibited on the Sabbath. So we are free to worship God during this time. This is what the Jews teach. This is the whole point of Christians coming to church. We're free of all the responsibilities of the week to just worship God. So people are commanded to dedicate this day to their inner lives and their families. In the Hebrew language, the word is kadosh, which means holy. It means separate. You separate yourself from all the things that are not holy. And this holiness is defined as a separation from the daily mundane pursuits of the things that enslave us. It's separation from sin, and separation from that which enslaves us is the freedom that we seek. The final evening at Masada was Passover Eve. It's a night in which children were told about the great miracle of the Exodus when God brought the nation out of Egypt from bondage to freedom. A night in which each year the Jewish people make a covenant with God. And this covenant is established every year between the people of God and Israel as they celebrate the Exodus from the slavery to freedom, from bondage to redemption. On that holy day, on that sacred date, the men and the women and the children of Masada made their choice. Once it became obvious that the 10th Legion would breach the walls the following morning with their catapults and their siege machines, Eliezer ben Yar, the zealous leader, decided that all Jewish defenders, men, women, and children, should make this decision. I want to read to you the speech that was recorded by Eliezer to the people that day. This is his speech. My loyal followers, long ago we resolved to serve neither the Romans nor anyone else 
but only God, who alone is the true and righteous Lord of men. Now the time has come that forces us to prove, to, to prove our determination by our deeds. At a time like this, we must not disgrace ourselves. We have never submitted to slavery, even when it brought no danger with it. We must not choose slavery now, and with it, penalties that will mean the end of everything. If we fall, alive into the hands of the Romans. For we were the first of all to revolt, and should be the last to break off the struggle. And I think it is God who has given us this privilege, that we can die nobly and as free men, unlike any others who were unexpectedly defeated. In our case, it is evident that daybreak will end our resistance. But tonight we are free to choose an honorable death with our loved ones. This our enemies cannot prevent. However earnestly they may pray to take us alive, nor can we defeat them in battle. Let our wives die unabused. Let our children, without knowledge of slavery. After that, let us do each other in ungrudging kindness, preserving our freedom as a glorious winding sheet. But first, let our possessions and the whole fortress go up in flames. It will be a bitter blow to the Romans that I know to find our persons beyond their reach and nothing left for them to loot. One thing only let us spare. Our store of food. It will bear witness when we are dead to the fact that we perished, not through want, but because we, as resolved as the beginning, chose death rather than slavery. After that speech, the men took their wives and children to different places on the mountain. And each man took the life of his wife and his children. They came back to one of the buildings and they each wrote their names on an ostraca, small piece of pottery. And they drew names to see who the last one would be to live. They found those ostracas in a small place in a corner of one of the buildings. They do not know who the last one alive was. But the men took their lives, and when the Romans the next morning reached the wall, everything had been burned except for the food, and everyone lay dead, with the exception of two women and five children who actually hid there on the mountain. They lived to tell the story to Josephus of the speech and what was made on that mountain. For Herod, Masada was a royal citadel and a place where there could be refuge if necessary. Herod never found refuge there. The site was actually first discovered in 1842, but the first excavations didn't take place until 1963. For many years, the Israeli Defense Forces were sworn in to their positions in the, in the Israeli army on the top of Mount Masada. And they promised on that mountain that Masada would never fall again. It remains a symbol today of the determination of a people to be free in their own land. It stands as a monument representing two completely different views. Herod 
motivated by desire for fame and immortality. Built a great fortress of palaces, there will be a monument to himself. There's also a monument laid bare, almost as a altar that had burned everything on the top. So the commitment to follow God and God alone and not be slaves to anyone but God himself. Wow. Just a few miles north of Masada is a place I'd mentioned earlier called En Gedi where David hid from, from uh, King Saul. But I want to take you to a particular scripture. I want to take you to Psalm 18 and close in this. David writes this psalm, and I think this psalm is just so amazing to recap the story. And I want to ask you this question today. Have you ever felt like the enemy surrounds you? Have you ever felt there's no place to go? Have you ever been in a time of hopelessness, despair, discouragement, depression? A place you just don't know what to do. The Psalms are made up of situations like that where people felt that way. And we know that David felt that way. And David writes this in Psalm 18. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise. And I have been saved from my enemies. In my distress I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for my help. From his temple he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. He rescued me from my powerful enemy. From my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. My God turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against troops. With my God, I can scale a wall. As for God, he shields all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? Is God who arms me with strength and keeps my ways secure. Your right hand sustains me. Your help has made me great. You provide a broad path for my feet so that my ankles do not give way. You arm me with strength for battle. You humble my adversaries before me. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be God my Savior. Therefore I will praise you. Lord, among the nations I will sing the praises of your name. He gives his king great victories. This is talking about what David. He shows unfailing love to his anointed, to David, and to his descendants forever. Ever been trapped on a mountain in a desolate place? God is your victorious one. God is your strength. God is your source of water. When the armies surround you, and freedom is the only thing you seek. We live in a culture today where we are surrounded by captivity. Captivity of prejudices, of hate of anger, of things that go against the freedoms that God has given us. There are people who would destroy the freedoms of America today. A nation that was found on the principles of God, of Jesus Christ himself. The Judeo-Christian values to begin with Abraham are still alive today. And God is still giving victory today to anyone who calls on his name. The next time you feel surrounded by enemies, lift up your eyes to the Lord. 
for there comes your salvation. So, Father, today as we just reflect on this incredible place called Masada, a place of courage, a place where people were determined to live free, free to live for you, and not free to live in the bondage of man's laws or the bondage of man putting his own restrictions on you. For, Lord, you are the only giver of freedoms, and your law is freedom. Your grace is freedom, and your mercy is freedom. Father, give us the ability to reach out to you and look to you when we're standing in this mountain where it just seems like we're surrounded. Let us give you our depression. Let's give you our anger, our concern, our fear. Let's call in the name of Jesus Christ and be free. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on this trip to Masada on our dig series sponsored by One Heart for Israel. We hope to see you next time. Blessings.